Hi, it's Valkren, and I've got something special for you today. If you don't know, I've been doing some VOD review this season for LCS games. I've watched all the games in NALCS and done many reviews on stream. And one team that's been really struggling is the Golden Guardians. And as the weeks have gone on and on, I've seen more and more people jump on the bandwagon to hate on the Golden Guardians. I've seen fans talk about how terrible it is to be a fan, how the organization is clueless, how many of the players don't deserve to be on the team, the most ridiculous comment I've seen actually called for every member on the team to be replaced. And how can anyone actually say that? When I've watched their games, I saw a team that's better than 10th place. When you look at this roster, you should actually be impressed by it. Four of the members have been on top LCS teams in the last two years. Contracts, Deathly, Lorelo have individual strong mechanics, and High is an experienced leader that has made his name through winning games he had no business winning. In theory, this team can win by having two winning lanes and have High lead them to easy victories in the late game. Just on paper, this roster already sounds great, but it's not even just on paper. Whether looking at stats or using the eyeball test, this team actually looks good. In fact, what I've been most impressed by was players like Golden Guardians Lorlo, who's been able to generate leads against the league's top best top laners. Lorlo's averages for CS per minute, KDA, kill participation, are actually above the league average, despite the team having zero wins. Contracts has been able to make his opponent play scared in the jungle by constantly counter-jungling and pressuring the opposing jungler, and he's usually doing this alone, as the rest of Golden Guardians are trying to play a more risk-adverse play style. The bot lane on Golden Guardians has never played together before, but they've already won against much stronger teams in the bottom lane, and High can still be the leader we all know he is. Altogether, the Golden Guardians have had two games with clear leads until minor macro mistakes led them to throw the game. And throws happen for them as teams. They throw because they have a number of problems. They've made it obvious in which champion picks they wanted to play in champion select. They've picked ineffective champion combinations and team comps at times and given up champions to opponents that have made their name from playing those champions. And on top of that, they haven't shown a proper understanding of priorities in the season. And despite all these team-wide problems, what I said earlier stands true. They've been in positions to win multiple games. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that Golden Guardians have had problems but they still look pretty good. They are way better than fans make them out to be. They aren't a hopeless team. They also aren't a playoff team, but I think they could be. With the right coach, bringing the right drafts, building confidence, trust, and communication, and helping the team to adjust to the new state of the game, the Golden Guardians can become a playoff team, and I want to be the one that does it. I want to be the one that leads this promising roster to the playoffs. I want to be the one to help the former stars show that they're still top players. I want to be the one to help Deftly break through and become the Rookie of the Year. I want to be the one to turn the Golden Guardians into the Challenger Guardians. And I'm serious about this. I'm making this video to be my public application to the Golden Guardians. I want to be on your new coaching staff to help build this team into a playoff team. I don't want to be a coach that ambiguously says, I can make this team good without giving any specifics. With this video, I want to go into detail about the problems I see for the Golden Guardians. I want to prove I'm not just talking big when I say I can help the Golden Guardian succeed in the LCS. The new Golden Guardians coaching staff will have many places they can target right away to help the team. But the obvious place to start is the draft. The Golden Guardians draft phase has many problems right away and is very easy to improve. Fixing the draft problems and making the draft the strength of the team would be a huge asset. The first consistent weakness in the Golden Guardians drafts is that they telegraph their picks and they let the opposing team know exactly what they want to play. In half their games, Golden Guardians makes it extremely obvious that they're going to pick NAR. In these three games, they telegraph the NAR pick by banning champions you normally don't frequently see banned together in first rotation, Orn and Jace. These champions alone can be good against a lot of different picks top lane, but when you ban both of them so early into the draft, the opponent will immediately think that you want to play NAR. In Golden Guardians games against CLG and Liquid, their telegraphy meant Golden Guardians gave away free knowledge to their opponents about their team comp. This knowledge lets the other team plan ahead and build team compositions that specifically work well against what Golden Guardians wants to draft. In addition to this, if Guardians doesn't first pick NAR, the opponent can take NAR. And if the opponent gets NAR, then the Golden Guardians bans actually help their opponents. However, in the FlyQuest game, FlyQuest actually used their last ban on NAR making the Orn and the Jace bans from Golden Guardians early on nearly worthless. The best way to show telegraphing their picks 
and how it's hurt Golden Guardians is to look at their game against Team Liquid. Golden Guardians is going to telegraph more than just their top lane pick this game, but they're also going to telegraph their mid lane champion pick. And this is dangerous because they're forced to draft it very early into their, their picks and bans, but their bans also telegraphed exactly what they were going to play ahead of time, leading Team Liquid to come up with a plan ahead of time with how to deal with this type of composition or how to deal with it. Golden Guardians bans Jace first. And normally Jace is used as a counter pick against Gnar and Gangplank. But when you follow up a Jace ban with a Gangplank ban, this makes it really obvious that you are banning these two out so that you can play Gnar effectively. And then they end up using their third ban to protect High. And it's a really strange ban being Corky, not frequently played in an ALCS. In fact, when Corky has been played, it's been in only circumstances in which Galio has been drafted. So when they end up banning the Corky, the Gangplank, and the Jace, this telegraphs their solo laners. Team Liquid is then able to ban other choices that they're afraid of in draft. Wild card type picks like junglers or the top lane split push with Camille that can get out of control and Nunu. So Team Liquid is able to shore up their weaknesses in other areas, more broader sense, whereas Golden Guardians is not only done very specific bands in a certain fashion, but they've already telegraphed the type of composition that they're going to run, which involves Gnar and Galio, which is a dive composition. So the Corky ban, teams aren't really playing Corky outside of when Galio is available. Team Liquid counters Gnar with Orn. So Golden Guardians telegraphed the Gnar pick, but they also left up Orn, which can handle Gnar and farm out that landing phase. But beyond that, the Galio pick is still very much telegraphed, and so Golden Guardians feels obligated that they have to pick Galio and one of these last two picks going into the sec second draft phase because they don't want to have it banned. At this point, if you've wasted one of your ban if you've wasted a ban on a counter pick to a champion you want to play that is unique, it is pretty difficult to let it go to the second draft phase. There were a couple champions left still available for mid lane that could give Galio a frustration mid lane. But one of the best mid lane champions right now is Azir. Azir does very well in bullying a lot of melee champions. In fact, one of the reasons why you don't see melee champions very often, you can see Team Liquid pretty confident right now when they select this, is because they know how effective it can be against the Golden Guardians composition. And at this point, there is little mystery if, if not any at all with the fact that Golden Guardians is going for a dive comp protecting Kog'Maw. Golden Guardians more than likely telegraph their support pick as well. This is because of their unique bans on top of this. They end up banning Janna and Morgana. And Janna is not a champion you've seen frequently in the NALCS so far or in a lot of regions. It has been picked only one time so far by CLG against 100 Thieves and with a composition that I suspect that Golden Guardians wanted to draft since they telegraphed their picks, they were pretty much adamant on getting this type of composition and they end up banning or they end up getting the Jarvan and the Braum. And if you've done your research and preparation, you would know in the 100 Thieves versus CLG game when Biofrost was playing Janna, he was against a Braum support in a Jarvan jungle. And what ended up happening was the Jarvan was able to camp that lane and they were able to systematically kill Janna several times. So if they had known that they were going to end up having the Jarvan and the Braum, they would have been able to deal with the Janna pick. But on top of this, they also banned Morgana, making it pretty obvious that they were going to end up going with either Alistar or Braum here, considering how their two support picks end up pointing in that direction. And on top of this, Team Liquid ends up taking Tarek just to ensure that their composition has Taric, but on top of this, they can stop Golden Guardians from potentially drafting the Taric. So the composition from Golden Guardians from the very start very much looked like a dive comp. Telegraphing the Gnar and the Galio makes it pretty obvious what type of composition is going to end up being formed. And this allowed Team Liquid to not only get counter picks on two of their lanes, but they knew what the overall picture of the composition was going to look like for Golden Guardians. And so they were able to effectively craft a composition 
that had ways of dealing with a dive composition. In fact, actually every single one of their champions have ways to deal with a dive composition. So in the end, even though Golden Guardians drafted a composition that could work and could be considered a decent team composition, them telegraphing their picks ends up giving too much, inform in too much information away to Team Liquid and it allows Team Liquid to effectively craft a team composition to deal with it and plan ahead. Team Liquid was able to dominate both the draft and the game in large part because of the telegraphing that Golden Guardians did in the draft phase. Unfortunately, Golden Guardians draft phase problems go beyond just telegraphing picks. One mistake they've made is that they've drafted in suboptimal orders in their games. Specifically in the game against TSM, Golden Guardians drafts Corky at least one pick too early. Many of you might think this is no big deal, but by drafting Corky with third pick overall, Golden Guardians allowed Bjergsen to pick any counterpick that he wanted. Golden Guardians could have taken Corky one slot later in the draft. This would have forced Bjergsen to either blind pick his mid lane champion or wait until the final pick phase to draft his champion. If Bjergsen picks his champion early, High can get the counter pick on Bjergsen. If Bjergsen chooses to wait until later he, uh, to pick his mid lane champion, then Golden Guardians can still pick Corky, but they also are able to ban away two strong champions against Corky in the second ban phase. By drafting just one slot later, Golden Guardians could have reduced the advantage that TSM had in the mid lane and potentially even secured a favorable matchup for High. It's not just that Golden Guardians draft in a poor order and telegraph their picks. In a lot of their games, the team compositions that Golden Guardians ends up with are not as effective as they could be. They pick champions who have not been working out very well in North America. Just take Jarvan, for example. He has a ludicrously low win rate in North America of about 15%, over 15 games. Having mentioned that Contracts has played Jarvan in half his games, that pick is definitely something that teams probably should review. By taking a more effective tank jungler like Sichuani in these games, Golden Guardians could have a more consistent team composition that can scale. And instead of taking Jarvan, which falls behind unless Contracts and his team can gain and maintain a lead in the early and mid game. This pick requires strong coordination in the early game just to offset the scaling that a better tank like Sichuani has in the late game. And just once we've had an absolute utter disaster of a draft. In the game against Clutch, Guardians drafted a composition that actually has been consistently been a bad comp for both in NA and around the world. It failed for Team Liquid against 100 Thieves. It failed numerous times in China and Korea. And it actually failed also with SKT when they played it against one of the worst teams in Korea, Kongdu Monster. So what happens in this draft that's bad enough to lose teams so many games all over the world? Well, in the draft phase, Golden Guardians took Vladimir as their top laner and Azir as their mid laner. When you pick these two champions, they have two distinct weaknesses together. First, you have no way to deal with split pushing champions that are actually considered good. If your opponents pick a champion that can split push either from the top lane or the mid lane as a pick and later in the game, you have to win before that champion can get enough items to effectively start split pushing. If you don't, you have to send one of Azir or Vlad to answer that split push, which is unlikely to be able to match the other team's pressure, and also it takes away from your own team's ability to team fight. The second major weakness is that you're forced to draft particular champions in the support and jungle role. What I mean is that with these picks, you have to draft tanks and engage. If you don't draft tanks, then you can't even team fight properly. If you don't draft engage, you have no initiative and rely on the other team to put themselves in bad positions. In this draft, Golden Guardians finishes the comp out with Kha'Zix and Taric, which is another example of them drafting ineffective compositions that I mentioned a minute ago. Golden Guardians did not draft Engage. They didn't have a real tank. They tried to work around the weaknesses of the comp using Taric, but this was still an ineffective way to finish out the composition. Clutch finished their draft with the Evelyn pick, which allowed them to punish Golden Guardians' inability to lane against the split push and gangplank even harder. From the draft phase until the end of the game, Golden Guardians faced an uphill battle. Clutch played around Eve's invisibility, Gangplank's pressure, and Tristana's range advantage against the no-engage comp of Golden Guardians, and allowed this to lead to Golden Guardians having three exposed inhibitors at 35 minutes, and Clutch closed the game out mere minutes later. Even with all the draft problems I've mentioned so far, Golden Guardians have been in positions to win multiple games. And some of you might be thinking, well, if they were in a position to win a game, why did they lose? There are two big reasons why Golden Guardians have been losing these winnable games. 
First and foremost, the Golden Guardians appear to have a major problem in communication between team members, especially between high-end contracts. Golden Guardians have taken disadvantageous 2v2s in the mid lane. They've had multiple games where their team has been keeping up in gold and keeping up in objectives but before taking a really bad 2v2 mid lane and losing all of their advantage. It would be results-based thinking to say they've been losing directly because they fail a 2v2 in the mid lane, but I would argue that the bad 2v2s are a sign of a much bigger problem. When I watch these games, these plays look very bad because of the circumstances that the fights happen around. For example, in the Golden Guardians game versus Cloud9 game, High and Contracts continued to play aggressive despite Lorlo warning his team that the opposing Kled was heading downriver. Lorlo's warning was either unheeded or imprecise. Either way, this is a breakdown of communication. This led to Cloud9 getting a two-for-one trade in the mid lane, denying High a stacked wave and snowballing licorice. Another example came in the game against TSM. Golden Guardians opted to a 2v2 mid lane that they know is a 2v2. The Rift Herald was just taken by Mike Young. Contracts just missed all of his abilities on Bjergsen. High had teleport against Bjergsen's heal, and everyone had flash and stopwatches up. Let me repeat, Mike Young was headed mid lane after doing Rift Herald. Contracts had his abilities down. Bjergsen's Talia had every ability available and summoner advantage over High. Even so, High still chooses to Valkyrie forward as Contracts was retreating. This is another example of Golden Guardians just not being on the same page and making a desperation play. But the worst 2v2 I've seen Golden Guardians take was in their game against Team Liquid. What happens can only be described as a desperation play that is a result of a communication breakdown. The 2v2 between uh, High Contracts and x and Publisher this game told me a lot about what could be systematically wrong with Golden Guardian's early game. And one of the things that I really need to talk about before we set the scene of this play is that High had Ignite going into hit the early part of his lane. So he started with Ignite, he's got Spellbook, he switched to Teleport, didn't use it to come back mid lane, he actually walked back mid. He is behind in CS, and he's itemizing very defensively, going for Adaptive Helm first on Galio, which means that he has almost no ability power besides his Doran's Ring. And there's not a lot of damage to offer from Galio that could be here normally if you itemize differently or still had Ignite. Pellbelter went for heal this game instead of cleanse. You would sometimes see cleanse on the Azir in a similar circumstance if he was afraid of early pressure, but he still opted for the heal which could effectively help him in the 2v2 more than cleanse. So on top of all of this, on top of the fact that High doesn't have an offensive summoner anymore, is going for a defensive build, on top of the fact that both junglers spot each other and knew going into this play, and both mid laners knew this going into this play, everybody opts into the 2v2. And it could be due to the fact that Golden Guardians had been told in preparation that they needed to gank mid because they had, Pobelter did end up getting the Azir, and Galio is behind in this matchup, and it's historically going to be behind in this matchup. So it might have been sheer desperation that they tried to force this. But the communication breakdown is very clear because Hyde chose for this lane not to be as gankable as it could be. When he has the teleport, when he saves the teleport, when he went defensive, this is effectively saying that he wants to make plays outside of his lane with his teleport. So now high end contracts are taking this desperation play in the mid lane when they're at a disadvantage in the summoner spells in the 2v2. To me, this is a communication breakdown. High end contracts aren't on the same page and they're not accomplishing what their composition is actually meant to do. And if they really wanted to gank mid lane, then high would have just gone damage items and kept ignite. But at this point, instead of just taking this 2v2 fight, high end contracts could have communicated with their top and bot to try to set up a play that Azir simply couldn't follow due to his lack of teleport, whereas High had teleport, and there's a variety of ways they could have played that. Galio ulting to the side lane, teleporting back mid after, TP into the side lane. Like, there are a variety of ways they could have made plays anywhere on the map besides mid lane. And because this 2v2 failed mid, Lurlo, with his lead, isn't being exploited, and Galio's advantage as a pick isn't being used during the windows where it's going to be strongest in the mid game. The problem in how Golden Guardians use Galio in the clip also hints at the second major problem I think Golden Guardians has. I think they do not take full advantage of their champions or the strengths of their teammates. 
ineffective use of their teammates and their champions is the second major problem I think Golden Guardians has that causes them to throw games. For example, Lorlo is consistently getting both top priority and CS leads in top lane. And this makes sense because he's both a good player and being given priority in the draft. However, we have yet to see Golden Guardians exploit his lead. His teammates had yet to attempt a dive or really to even attempt a gank top lane. They really just put Lorlo on an island in a meta where top lane is more like a freeway than an island. Everybody's passing through. Unsealed spellbook users mid lane and bot lane, teleporting top lane. Effective roaming champions like Galio, Talia, Malzahar, and Ryze are being picked mid. And junglers are still targeting top lane since looking bot is not always possible because of the tank supports and how they can heavily disengage. In terms of Golden Guardians not taking advantage of their champions, just rewatch the Galio clip from earlier. Heiz Galio wasn't effectively using his roaming potential before he had already died in lane. I found a clip that I think shows a great example of Golden Guardians making poor use of the tools available to them in the game. The following clip will be from the CLG versus Golden Guardians game. Golden Guardians is in a unique position to set up a play under CLG's top turret, and in which they would have the numbers advantage, and this can be guaranteed by them. High was in a situation where he based before Huhi on Rise, so he would be back mid lane sooner. On top of this, he has Teleport, and he gets to have mid priority at this point in time for the first roam opportunity during this time frame. Including the fact that Stixa doesn't even have teleport yet, and he's splitting bot lane against Gnar that will have teleport up in a very short period of time. Couple that with the fact that Tarek is about to base, and Golden Guardians already has three people top lane. They're in a position to make a play happen, and they knew this, except they aborted the play for reasons unbeknownst to us, besides the fact that they weren't confident going into it, and maybe the communication and trust wasn't 100% there. One of the important things to note is that during this time frame, Lorlo is actually able to stop the base from Six A as well. So the base from Six A is stopped. He has to recall, then switch to teleport, then TP to the play. And at this moment in time, Lorlo has his teleport up. Vlad is walking top lane, doesn't even have to use his teleport. And on top of this, Matt is about to ward in between the turrets, enabling them to even have a flank play with the Gnar. And they go for this, or they, they seem to go for this, and then what happens was very strange. They just completely abort the play. They had the opportunity to make this work. Ter Tarek wasn't in lane yet. The ward but in between the turrets was here. Matt actually was behind their turret seemingly trying to set up the play except golden guardians decided not to go for it and it may have been entirely because they gave up the wave but by giving up the wave it gave matt the opportunity to ward behind and in between those turrets setting up for the play where lorlo could be there and tristana couldn't be there and Tarek wasn't quite there yet and instead of going for this play shifting vlad from mid to top walking there not even teleporting uh, and tristana still staying bot lane hasn't even based yet they end up not going for the play during this time period and in fact two minutes later they go for a very similar dive and it doesn't work out in the same way that the first dive would have set up because they didn't have a numbers advantage so they passed up an opportunity whether it was not through sheer lack of communication but maybe it was in part because they didn't trust the teamwork to be there and this is a very significant fact and a weakness of the current golden guardians play style at this point, I've mentioned most of the major problems I have with the Golden Guardians drafts and play, and given enough evidence from their games that they've played. And I think that if the next coaching staff fixes these big picture issues that I've laid out in this video, the Golden Guardians will steadily move up the rankings. The Golden Guardians have already been playing pretty well. They just need to fix these specific problems. And by shoring up these holes in the draft, Golden Guardians can set their players up for success instead of giving them a handicap going into the game. By coaching the team on their communication and trust in their teammates, the Golden Guardians will gain the confidence in themselves and their team and also gain the synergy they need to take down the top teams in the league. And by helping the team grow in their understanding of the meta, you move the already strong individual players in a better direction for Hyde to lead them to victory. I just think that this is a very important time for Golden Guardians because they can either fill their coaching staff with positive influences or with forces that will only hinder the team's progress. And I want to be one of the positive forces driving Golden Guardian's future success. 
If I could talk to the Golden Guardians management, I would say this. Experience is absolutely important. Life experience and relevant skills to League of Legends will be necessary for those that will be leading your team in the future. But experiences come in many forms. Over the years, I've been building up experience that I think would easily transfer into being a coach for a competitive team. For the last five years, I've made my living through coaching, streaming, and producing educational League of Legends content tailored to analyzing every meta and figuring out the best ways to play the game. And I've proven my knowledge and analytical skills by being consistently top 200 in the ladder from the League of Legends beta until season six. I've reached challengers several times while playing every single position in the game, proving that my knowledge and understanding and my ability to adapt was consistent throughout League of Legends. Very few people have played for as long as I have and maintain as high of a level of skill as I have. The number decreases substantially when you look at only the current coaches for the professional league teams. To be a great coach, you don't have to be a great player, but it absolutely would be a massive benefit to be able to understand from a top level player's perspective. In terms of the skills that I have that I think can directly translate to being a good coach, I have an analytical mind and an eye for detail that few others have. I constantly keep up with every aspect of League of Legends, from the trends I've seen in any region's online ladder to the up-to-date weaknesses of strong picks in the professional scene. I constantly work to better myself and to, and to improve the content that I put out for others to see. I think that I have great negotiating skills and general communication skills that many other candidates do not have, even those with coaching experience. I need to develop these skills just to survive these last five years as a self-employed and self-sustaining member of the league community. The evidence of my skills is in everyone that's ever thought of me, thought enough of me to hire me as a personal coach or to watch and share my stream and YouTube content. Those people may be watching this video, so I just wanna say once again, truly, thank you. I guess all I really wanna to say to the Golden Guardians organization and to their management is this. I think that the skills I've developed every day of my life have been for the sake of becoming an LCS coach in League of Legends. Golden Guardians now have an opportunity to add a coach to their roster that is driven, knowledgeable, and highly skilled with dealing with other players. I believe in your organization, and I believe that I would be a perfect fit as a coach for you. I just hope that you believe in me too.